So I went to my first computing conference when I was a graduate student, and I was working at the intersection between earth science and computing. But after listening to some of those talks in high-performance computing, I was like, I felt like I walked into a bodybuilding studio. A, it was almost all men, and B, everyone was talking about power, computing power. So yes, fewer tattoos, but a lot of the similar dynamics. It all seemed to be about who had the biggest computer. <laughs> so I felt a little bit lost, because I had written all of my own code, and instead of running on this massive supercomputer, it ran on my tiny little laptop. But my presentation was actually quite well received. Not because it was an extraordinary code, it really wasn't all that, but because I was talking about a purpose that people cared about, understanding volcanic eruptions. So after the talk, a guy comes up to me and says, you know what your code lacks in high performance? It makes up in high purpose. Way to go. So don't get me wrong, high performance computing is great. There's nothing wrong with a little muscle, right? But today, I want to showcase some examples of what I would like to think of as high purpose computing. And I'll try to convince you that we really need both. Because just like ordinary codes can have quite an extra extraordinary potential, we're learning that in the natural world, very ordinary processes can have a really extraordinary role to play. So let's start our journey into the extraordinary with something that is very ordinary, an ice cube. We all have them in our fridges, water glasses, sodas. So by experience, we're all experts on ice cube melting. We do it every day. Let's see about that. Here's the world's biggest ice cube, the Antarctic continent. And it's just that, right? It's this massive block of ice surrounded by a warming ocean, just like its little brother in our water glass. So it seems obvious that this guy should melt just like its little brother. Turns out it doesn't. And we know that from satellite images like this one. What you see here is the speed with which the ice is flowing towards the coast. In the blue zones, it's barely moving. In the red zones, it's racing along. And to put that speed difference into perspective, this speed difference is comparable to a pedestrian and a Formula One race car. So it's more than just a little bit faster. And what that means is that Antarctica is melting in a completely different way than its little brother because its little brother is, moving, is melting from the outside in. We're losing the ice at the edges first, and the ice in the center last. But through these artery-like drainage zones, Antarctica is already losing ice from close to the center of the continent. So it's melting inside out. And if that wasn't enough of a surprise, there's actually a bigger surprise to come. So let's zoom into one part of Antarctica, which is called the Sipal Coast. And the Sipal Coast has four ice streams. These are these arteries. And we care so much about them, we named them. But I would like you to focus on the center of this figure, and there's a blue blob there. And this blue blob used to be one of those arteries, one of those ice streams. And then 150 years ago, it disappeared, just like that. Wait, that's science, but that's magic, right? So what's going on here? These arteries are not like the arteries in your body. They're not, they're not fixed in space and time. They shift, they turn on and off, they accelerate, they slow down, they do crazy stuff. And that means that the sea level rise associated with some of those rapid changes could be very extreme and rapid, contrary to the little brother in the ice in the water glass that is melting slowly and gradually. And keep in mind that all of this was well before climate change, right? So the big picture question now is, how will this whole flow morphology change as we're messing with the climate? And that's what we need to figure out. So what the heck is so different between Antarctica and the little ice cube in the water glass? They both have air on top. They're both surrounded by warming waters. But Antarctica is grounded. It sits on an entire continent. And that's the trick. Let me peel away the data layer that shows you ice speed. And let's have a look at that subsurface. The first thing you notice, it's quite flat, right? So it's not the shape of the ground that controls ice flow. And although you can't tell it from this figure, neither is it a different in the nature of the subsurface, because to the best of our knowledge, this entire area is covered in the same kind of sediment. So what is it? What could it be? Turns out, it's something as ordinary as water, 
because as the ice is rubbing against the sediment, there's a little bit of water that's created. How can ordinary water have such an extraordinary effect? Let's return to a quite ordinary environment to explore that, the beach. Here's a sandcastle. What's the trick to building one of these? You have to get the water content just right. If you have too much water, it becomes a slurry and it flows. If you have too little water, it becomes crumbly and does no longer hold its shape. And that means that just by adding water, I can change the very nature of this material. I can go from completely fluid to completely solid just through the addition of water. And that's the trick to understanding Antarctica, because that's what we think is going on underneath the ice in Antarctica. If the ice is moving just a tiny bit faster in one zone, it's rubbing against the sediment a tiny bit more, which creates a tiny bit more heat and a tiny bit more meltwater. But even this tiny bit more meltwater can have a huge effect on the behavior of the sediment, because the sediment disintegrates. Interestingly, though, that's not the full story even yet. Because as we have more and more water raining down, the water no longer distributes evenly. That's a little bit like walking out on a rainy day. The first thing that happens is the entire surface gets wet. But as, as I add more and more water, the water begins to find its own little pathways. It creates puddles, it creates streams, it seeps into the ground. And that process creates a patchwork of wet and almost dry. And this patchwork translates into a patchwork of stable and unstable underneath Antarctica. So what that means is to understand the melting processes we Antarctica, in Antarctica, we really have to go down to this minuscule, to this extraordinarily small scale of understanding meltwater percolation at the scale of individual sand grains. But by embracing that complexity, we can understand three things that seemed completely out of reach before. Why the ice is flowing so fast? Because the sediment underneath is disintegrating. Why I have these strong variations in ice speed? Because the sediments underneath are sometimes really strong and sometimes really weak. And maybe most importantly, why ice streams can just disappear. And that's because they're ultimately just the reflection of the water flow in the subsurface. And water can easily rearrange in a couple of days or weeks. So to me, the story of Antarctica really shows the extraordinary power of this delicate dance between sediment and water. But if that's really so powerful, right, if that's really true, shouldn't we be able to use these processes to actually tame extreme events? Seems crazy to consider it. But let's try it out for one moment, and let's switch to a different natural system, tsunamis. Here's the 2011 tsunami hitting the coast of Japan. What is a tsunami? It's a water wave, a massive water wave. It can build up to 40 meters along the coast in this case. It almost created a nuclear meltdown. But you also notice that as the tsunami moves on shore, it changes its character profoundly. It no longer looks like a wave. It now starts to look like a current. Let's move in shore a little more. I bet, had I shown you this picture out of context, you wouldn't have guessed that this is a water wave. It looks like a mudslide, right? So what's going on here? As the tsunami is propagating over land, it's eating up everything and anything in its pathways, the sediment, the soil, the rocks, the vegetation, the cars, the houses, everything. But all of that slowly and gradually changes the very nature of this phenomenon. So even the extraordinary power of a tsunami is no match to the quite ordinary interactions of sediment and water. And that's why we're working on this, because maybe we can make progress towards the extraordinary challenge of saving lives at risk from a tsunami by understanding the process through which this tsunami is slowing down on shore. Now, I'm guessing that some of these examples, like tsunamis in Antarctica, might seem somewhat remote, right? So let's return to something that is more familiar, closer to home. Earthquakes. We're the earthquake capital of the world, right? OK, maybe the US. But still, we like a couple of good vibrations once in a while. It turns out we're actually having some serious competition from a rather unexpected place, Oklahoma. What you're looking at here is the number of earthquakes in Oklahoma you can actually feel, which means magnitude three or greater. There wasn't much going on until just recently, right? But in 2014, Oklahoma had four times as many earthquakes as California. How is that even possible? Turns out, 
we're injecting millions and millions of barrels of wastewater into the subsurface in Oklahoma. So no, it's not fracking. It's even more profane than that. It's just wastewater that's associated with hydrocarbon production. But we're dumping it down there. So what you're seeing here is our intervention. That's our doing. So I think it's important to try to figure out how we can understand this process better to make sure we're not taking unnecessary risk. Because just like in Antarctica, what you're looking at here is ultimately the consequence of water percolation at the scale of small rocks, at the granular scale. So what do all of these cases, all of these projects have in common? What's the commonality between all of them? Ultimately, the common purpose for each of these projects for us is to save lives that are at risk from extreme events. And we're trying to do that by focusing on understanding the physical processes that govern this very delicate dance or this very delicate feedback loop that is expressed in these extreme events. High-performance computing, I don't think, is quite going to cut it, primarily because our understanding of these processes isn't quite deep enough yet to really understand the checks and balances at play, and also our role in affecting them. And that's where high-purpose computing comes in to me, to provide the missing pieces of the puzzle that we need to figure this out. Because if we want the real answers to these big, extraordinary challenges, for the natural world, we often have to think exceedingly small and ordinary. Thank you.